We have a very, very special guest joining us today. One of the hottest writers in comics, one of the names that is ascending. It feels like every single month a new book drops that makes Philip Kennedy Johnson's stock rise that much more. We are here with the writer of the recently critically acclaimed and fan favorite run on Action Comics, current writer on Green Lantern War Journal on Incredible Hulk, and the winner of the 2023 Pallies, the Comics Pals Award for Best Writer, Philip Kennedy Johnson. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, man. It's a huge honor, guys. Thanks. Absolutely. You are you are very welcome, and you earned it around these parts through incredible work that we are so happy about. Our audience is happy that we have you on board. We've got questions from the audience. We've got people here live with us. Thank you for joining us live. We are going to dive into everything that you can imagine we're going to want to talk <laughs> to Philip Kennedy Johnson about. And as we've been teasing for weeks, we will be doing a giveaway of your pick of Action Comics, Green Lantern War Journal, or The Incredible Hulk. Whichever volume one you want, you can win here today by asking a question of Philip Kennedy Johnson. And if you win, and it'll be random. If you win, we'll get that sent to you. Just message me on the Discord server. Thanks, guys. That's super uh, that's super generous. That's kind of neat. Yeah, well, you know what? Um, I go as far back as three years ago, around the time when your Action Comics run started. And we had listeners saying, hey, are you guys checking out, you know, Action Comics? This guy, Philip Kennedy Johnson, he's doing great stuff. And uh, for me, and I, we, when we spoke at New York Comic Con, I told you this, but Superman was not a character that I connected with. Mm. So, you know, I wasn't really that uh, happy with what was going on before you jumped on board. And so I didn't immediately get on mm -hmm. but it was every single month the listeners in our in our audience saying hey you guys got to check out action you got to check it out you got to check it out and so eventually we did and it's it just it just blew us away i know for me personally it turned me into a superman fan but i think we each have our unique experience with your run on action comics so you know it really is an honor to have you on board to talk about that and oh, a lot of thanks, other things man. i appreciate you saying that honor's mine and thanks to the listeners who are on there too Absolutely. And, and and giving more thanks to the listeners, if you'll give me just one minute, I do want to uh, run through some quick plugs before we dive into everything with Philip Kennedy Johnson. You guys know the drill. We're the Comics Pals. I'm not going to run through the whole plug list, but at the Comics Pals for anything that you want to get in touch with us for. If you want to support the show, the best way to do that is patreon.com slash the Comics Pals, where we are always giving you bang for your buck. If you want a nickname and a shout out and you want to join the Pals verse. You can do that by hitting us up on Patreon.com, and I want to shout out all the people that have done that. So a quick special shout out to the best pals in the universe. <clears throat> Thunderstruck Rebecca Alejandro, the Night Stalker, or I'm sorry, Hound of Justice Atomic Hound, and Starcrossed Catherine Stars. And I want to say thank you to the Night Stalker, Harris Najinsky, Brian Demolisher Del Pozo, Kefis the Incorruptible, Momenta Mike Elliott, Dan the Truth Trudeau, Joel Justice, Jalen the Sanguine Sorcerer, Marley Manistorm, Slow Flow Dameron, Amin Almighty Perez, Pete the Dream Weaver Collins, Christian Uncaged Harriet, and a new member who is joining us for the first time today, always laughing. And if you guys will just give me a moment, I want to give him his origin. So... Philip, what we do is people join us on Patreon and then we give them like a, a superhero super, uh, or supervillain nickname um, and they join like our own little shared universe that we have cooking. That's cool. So here's here's the newest one that we've got. So always laughing childhood was not an easy one. <clears throat> he bounced around from foster home to foster home, enduring the cruelties of many parents, some of who viewed him as little more than a check and a punching bag. Despite this, he remained a kind, hopeful child, and no amount of ill treatment could take his smile from him. He loved to laugh, and he loved to make people laugh. He heard once that his laughter is the best that laughter is the best med medicine, and he believed it. One day, he came upon his foster sister, who'd been brutally beaten and scared and unsure of how to help without a drawing on even more ab abuse. And he asked her, "Why can't an egg tell a joke?" She looked at him confused. Well, because it'll crack up. 
He laughed first, then a smile on her face, and then she laughed too. And as the children laughed, something miraculous happened. Her wounds began to heal. Open cuts and bruises faded. The more she laughed, and soon enough, she felt no pain. He knew right then what he needed to do with his life. And as quietly, without seeking recognition or praise, no one even knows his true name, set about to heal the world through laughter. I guess it's true what they say. Laughter is the best medicine. Nicely Dang. done. So Thank like you. that. Like a heroic joker in a way. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. That's Thank great, you. Man. That was fun. Appreciate it. And, and appreciate you always laughing for joining mm -hmm. us. I hope you enjoy your, your origin. All right. Enough about us. You guys know the rest of the drill. Let's put the focus squarely on the man of the hour, the guest of honor, Philip Kennedy Johnson. Oh, you too, Ken. Well, you have really exploded on the scene over the last few years. You know, again, Action Comics really took, I think, people by surprise in a lot of ways. And, you know, you weren't someone who had... Um, you know, you had some successes on the indie level, you know, you had the last sons of America with boom. Um, and so you, you got discovered, which is so cool by Brian Cunningham, mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. is a friend of ours. Great guy. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Brian's um, great. Yeah. And I think it's, it's so cool, your story. And I want you to expand on this because, you know, you, you kind of got into it just with your brother, you know, living in Kentucky, <laughs> reading comics and sort of like, hey, I could do that. We could kind of do that. And collaborating together sparked your your want to write comics. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, I am. Um, I mean, I had grown up learning to read from comics. Um, my dad had brought just he, he brought home boxes of, of ripped up books from um garage sales and flea markets and stuff um and he he used to brag that he had taught himself to read off of comics when he was a very small kid and so he would bring me these old comics for me to learn to read but it, to him it was just a tool to use to 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 teach me to read and to be to be discarded it was just junk you know but mm -hmm. i just really fell in love with the medium in the way that he never did i you know i would make my own comics and um just just loved them i very often i would i would kind of copy the drawings that i liked from from the books if i saw a really awesome image of superman or batman or whoever i would i would kind of copy it and do my own um i would write my own little garfield strips and things um i just i just loved them man and i um but all the books that i had were very old usually every now and again i would i would um be able to buy something new off of the spinner rack at a drugstore or at a grocery store or something, but I'd never seen actual, an actual comic shop. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I learned to love comic books, but I, um, I also played a lot of music and it, at, uh, at some point in like high school or something, I kind of veered towards music as far as what I wanted to do with my life. Um, there was a time when I wanted to be a, an, an artist, but I um, like that kind of fell fell to the wayside and I got into music professionally and uh, went to school for it and still love comics. But I honestly, at some point just kind of stopped reading for fun and it was all about college and it's just, just kind of sold my soul to the practice room and got as good as I could at music and everything else kind of, kind of, uh, you know, jumped out of the way. My brother also played trumpet as I do, but uh, also drew a lot. And um, he kind of went the other way. He wanted to be an artist. And um, so fast forward a little bit, and I have a job playing in one of the one of the premier bands in the military uh, in Washington, D.C. area. My brother's still at home. And um, he really wanted to get into comics and didn't really know how. He was he was kind of st still stuck in the country, going to community college, and he was doing okay, but he didn't like it. And I was like, man, I want to go to art school. I want to make comics. I don't know how to do this. And I just invited them to come out, move in with me, and that we'd figure it out together. I hadn't done any creative writing in forever, and I still loved comics in my heart, but I hadn't read one in forever. And it's like, just come out here, man. We'll we'll just figure it out together, and um, and that's what happened. So he just he came out here, and we found a great store, and um, started going to conventions, and 
finding trades that had the scripts in the back and, you know, the, the process stuff that you sometimes see. <clears throat> um, whenever we were at a con, we'd just kind of troll Artist Alley and find everyone we, that would talk to us and just kind of figure out how to do this thing. And we made some stuff together. And um, I, I just kind of kept looking for other people to work with. I really, I got the creative bug. I was like, man, this is just so badass. I love the creative process. It felt like music to me. It felt like small group jazz, the way that that comics are made. And I just really love the people, how unassuming they are. Like comics people are are the best. They just unapologetically like what they like. And there's no ego to it. There's no like I mean, I don't know how to describe it exactly. It's just like there's this honesty to it that I really admire. Um, so I don't know. I just really, really loved it. So I um started working with other people. And um, put together some pitch packets, and one of those got made into Last Sons of America, and that led to another book, and it just kind of worked out. Do you, That's awesome. Go ahead, Tyler. Do you remember some of the, some of those early books you you got from your dad? Like, um, yeah, I I still have them all. Like most of them, are, I mean, some of them I've given to my brother, um, but most of them are still here in the house. I've got the most influential one that I, that I often talk about on shows like this is Superman 400. That was this anniversary issue um, that had just the the greatest creators who were alive at that time in there. I mean, it was like the, if you see a, a list of the, if you see the credits list on the left edge of that cover, it's just stupid. It's like Bill Sienkiewicz, Will Eisner, Jack Kirby, Frank Miller, um, Jesus, I, I'm I'm leaving out the names of yeah. legends. Like Steranko did a full chapter in there. Many of those names just have like a pinup page, but some of them have full chapters. I mean, Steranko did a like the the final chapter of that issue. I think Elliot S. Magan wrote the whole thing, but there are all these short stories. The, the theme was just Superman in the future, and it was this amazing story. I am. Um, <clears throat> it was very. It had kind of a kind of a high art sort of fine art kind of kind of feel to it in a way that I didn't appreciate as a little kid because I would have been like six or seven or something if um well I, honestly I was probably reading it when it was not new so I guess I might have been seven or eight maybe nine but it was it made me feel so different than comics typically did back then and a lot of the art styles in that book were very unusual like Frank Miller's style was very stylized a couple of the other ones were too but there was also a Kurt Swan thing in there that I was more used to because I, you know, a lot of my comics were very old and I had a lot of Kurt Swan issues of Superman. Um, so anyway, that was a very influential book. I mean, all the comics that came home kind of eventually kind of fell into three big piles. Well, not even big piles by by proper um, collector standards, but big to me. <laughs> there was a a DC pile, a Marvel pile, and a, like a, just a funny books kind of like kid kid stuff kind of pile like um golden key and gladstone and um those kind of things. like the, the forerunners to ducktales like a lot of uh mm. you know beagle boys and huey dewey and louie and those kind of things nice. um and i was just kind of i kind of figured out the the dc and marvel canon through those books i figured out okay so spider-man belongs in this universe but batman and superman know each other and they're over here and they i kind of slowly you know, formed three piles of stuff based on what I was seeing in the books. Um, there were a lot of World's Finest and um, Superman family stuff, some Batman family books, a lot of Spider-Man, um, like Marvel team-up books in which Spider-Man would team up with somebody. And I got to know a lot of the Marvel characters that way. Um, so, yeah, it was, that was a lot of the stuff that was in there. And it was all, I mean, it was all in pretty rough shape. I still have those books and some of them are literally falling apart. Some of them had the, the thing where the, you know, the, I'm told that back in the day, the, the box of comics would come and the, the top copy would get like box cuttered across the front. So the, the cover was all jacked. Um, I had I have a lot of a lot of books in which the, the top cover is like sliced in half. Um, <laughs> well worn. So, yeah. Uh, you said something earlier about like being able to go to um, Artist Alley and you know have conversations. Or, or do you find that writers and artists <clears throat> are typically forthcoming about like their creative process? Like especially considering you you mentioned it feels like jazz, like that collaborative sort of side of it. Um, do they typically kind of just like spiel about how they how they think about comics? Yeah. I mean, very, I mean, 
the people that I talk to in Artist Alley are almost always too happy to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, especially if they're, especially if they haven't like quote unquote made it yet. If somebody is not, not yet a big name person that has a big line, they love talking about the process. They love talking about com- their love of comics, like what they're doing there and what they love to do, like the books that they love, the books that they're reading or, or grew up reading. Um, yeah. I mean, typically the people who are still kind of like in the trenches doing the thing are the people who really love talking about it. And I still do too, man. Um, it's, I don't know. It's just great. It's uh, one of the things about comics that I love is that nobody, I mean, everyone wants to get paid for their work. Obviously everyone, I mean, no one's going to say no to success, but nobody is in it to like to be the next Steven Spielberg or okay. whatever. No, no one's trying to make a billion dollars doing comic books they, or they do something else. Like it's all, they're all in it for love of the game. They, they're they there because it's just in them and they have to do it. You know, like I, I love that. I love reading work by people who just do it because they don't have any choice because mm. they just, they just love it. And that is what they're here to do. You know, was there, was there something in particular that stood out to you that like has stuck with you that somebody said? Somebody said there was actually a moment that stood out to me in a, I'll try to think of a better one that's like an actual answer to your question, but one sure, that yeah. one, one that popped out to, in my mind when you said that was actually in a in a retailer store <clears throat> where I I found I found this little hole in the wall store called Third Eye Comics, and now it's like this big, you know, insane success story. They just opened up their their mega store where it's like comics, games, and music and video, and it's a gigantic space. Um, they're just crushing it. Multiple stores. Back then, it was just this little ass place in a in a little strip mall thing that looked like it was a looked like it was a hole in the wall residential thing, like like tiny apartments that had been rezoned into commercial. But it was like basically no parking lot, very small. <clears throat> and um, but man, it was it was set up really well, very small but lovingly put together. Um, and Steve and Trish, the owners were clearly in it for love of the game, knew what they were doing, love what they were doing. And I'd been out of comics forever. This is right when my brother and I decided to do this thing. And I was kind of excited. I'd seen these little, these little, you know, wicket signs in the, in the median on the road for third eye comics. And I was excited to check it out. So I went in there and, um, and he was excited. Steve was excited to show me around because I told him like, I had loved comics, but I hadn't seen a new one in, you know, like decades and or at least a decade and so he was kind of showing me around and he uh i told him i had read x-men i was reading x-men back when i had gotten out of it and batman and just the just big two stuff because i mean anyone who wasn't reading x-men back then that was like age of apocalypse phalanx saga when joe mad was doing all this stuff anyone who wasn't reading x-men was human trash you know like that's <laughs> That's you just you had you had to read X-Men back then. Lower than like, the low. Yeah, the, the cartoon was on. It was like that was the cool thing. So I told him I was reading X-Men. So he went to he was so stoked to show me this book. And it was Astonishing X-Men by Joss Whedon and John Cassidy. Mm. Yeah. And um, you know, they did not have a lot of stock on the store, on the on the shelf, but he ripped the plastic off with no expectation to buy. He just ripped off the plastic and showed he wanted to show me how dope the art was. Because I was used to the stuff from back in the day, which was also great, but it was also very '90s and everything was very different. So he was he was so excited to show me where the like where the state of the art is now, and I'm seeing this mind blowing art by John Cassidy, <clears throat> and Steve was just so excited to show a fellow nerd this awesome book, um, and he just wanted to, so he just ripped off the plastic again with no expectation to sell it. He just wanted to show it to me, and that really stuck out to me because I know there were a lot of places where you know you don't open stuff unless you're going to walk out of there with it. Um, that made a big impression on me. Um, another one from an actual creator. Let me think of one that was, that was impactful. Um, that that felt, sorry, that, uh, that felt impactful because of how willing he was to share. Yeah. Just, he wasn't, he wasn't showing me that book because he was trying to make the sale of the sale. He was, he showed me the book because he just loved it. And he knew that I was going to love it because I was this X-Men fan. He was so stoked that, he found another fan that was roughly his age that grew up loving the same stuff as him. Although I'm sure his knowledge of comics like completely outstripped mine, like a hundredfold. He was so excited to show me how far things had come and where things were now. He showed me the boys. He showed me lock and key. Mm-hmm. He showed me American vampire. That was kind of when I was, when I was walking in, there were all these deconstruction of superhero tropes kind of happening. Irredeemable was new. 
Um, so between boy, I, I remember all these things, like, I mean, obviously Watchmen's been around forever, but that aside there, there were just all these deconstruction of superhero tropes happening. <clears throat> Most notably the boys and irredeemable. Um, but you're also seeing like American vampire and lock and key, which are just very different takes on the medium that I didn't know anything about. Um, he showed me preacher too. And, and again, it's not new, but it was new to me. Yeah. Um, he was just, he was just walking me around, showing me all the shit that he loved, you know? So that was just really, it was infectious, man. That, that excitement that he was, that he, that I saw from Steve, it was not like a salesman's, you know, he wasn't like, Hey, what do I got to do to get you in the car today? Kind of BS. It was like, I love this stuff and you're going to love it too. Like, yeah. look at this. And that was just so, <laughs> that was so infectious. Yeah. Um, but I get a lot of that same, a lot of that same kind of energy from comic creators too when they're out there. Um, I'm trying to think of another really great, like really great early um, interaction I had in Artist Alley. Um, let me think. There was that, I can't remember his, I don't know this dude's name anymore, man, but he was, there was a guy that um, his, his day job was painting like snowboards and skateboards. Nice. Um, but he was in, but he was in Artist Alley. I mean, he had his boards out, but he also was trying to make comics and um, he was just, you know, he didn't, he didn't really know shit either. He was just trying to get out there and do it, you know? Oh yeah. And, uh, and he was just so into it and stoked for this thing that he was making. Um, I don't know, man, just stuff like that. Just it's, it's like punk rock, you know, I just love it. And I, the people are getting out there. They aren't really, they hardly, hardly even know how to play, but they're on stage, you know? And yeah. I just, I think that's dope as hell. Yeah. It's very much just putting stuff out. Cause it, what else can you do? There's a, exactly. Like, yeah. Like, whenever <laughs> one, one kind of pet peeve that I have is like whenever people, um, kind of crap on something somebody else made online. Mm. I'm like, whenever I see somebody that, that made something and put it out, man, I'm so proud on their behalf. It's hard making stuff and it's hard putting it out there, especially when you know the trolls are out there just waiting, <laughs> you know? Right. You know, so whenever somebody craps on somebody else's book that they put out or their art, I'm like, man, you know, this guy made something. Like maybe, yeah, maybe you could do it better, but you didn't. They did. Yeah. You know, like they, made a th they made a thing that you did not make. So- Shut up and appreciate it. Go out and make your own thing. Mm. I, just, I think it's so awesome. Every time I see anyone that took the time to go to these cons, get a table, and and show stuff that they made, that takes stones and you know resilience. And I think it's awesome. Everybody, everybody's artist alley deserves a standing O in my book. Yeah, especially because of how hard it is to just even literally be there. Yeah, um, you guys like too. You know, you guys, you guys could be sleeping in. You're putting stuff out there. It's awesome. Well, I feel like the 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 passion and fervor for the medium that you talk about on the creator end also exists on the fan end on a lot of levels. You know, I can I can personally remember my first time at New York Comic Con and being dwarfed by the size coming from thinking that I don't know anyone who likes comics and then being in a place where it's like, oh, every single last person here feels exactly how I do about these things. That's a cool experience. It's an awakening and not like not every other thing that you could enjoy has a space for you to go to where you can literally see the evidence of how many people just love this. I know. It's it's so cool that we have these cons now where just the the medium is celebrated. I mean every con is different. Some of them are more about like celebrities or wrestlers or whatever the thing is. Yeah. But it's but you know, there's also this big comic space, and even when even the ones that are not like comic book heavy, there's still a lot of cosplay, and people show what they like. And I don't know, it's just dope. I mean, when I grew up, I was a nerd, man. I was a nerd when nerd went meant nerd. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when you know it wasn't like the cool thing. People say now, oh, I'm such a nerd. Like, yeah, that's not what that means anymore. Like, you're just you're just, you're trying to tell me you're cool. That's not what that used to mean. Um, back in the day, you had to kind of keep that stuff to yourself, or you know kind of on the sly find other people that like that stuff too like it's like finding somebody that has the same rare disease as you <laughs> you know it's um it's not like now where it's the cool thing and you get all the movies and you know grandma knows who thanos is like it didn't used to be that way right so i mean being in this place now where you can just like unapologetically love it and and, and put that out there like let the flag fly and 
you know, put on the costume and it's awesome. It's really fun. I just love that community, man. I really do. Speaking of putting on the costume, Superman. Mm -hmm. So Superman action comics, this was a, this was a run that went from issue 1029 to 1060. And then if you, if you factor in like <clears throat> specials and things like that, you know, it's well over 30 issues. And so you wrote a lot of Superman. I got the, uh, I got this tome right here. Yeah. The War World Saga Compendium. Yeah. This is, to me, to me, this is the best Superman story that I've read. Oh man, thanks so much. That's a You're challenge. welcome. I, 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 I had a moment while I was reading it where I was like, oh man, I don't want this to end though. You know that moment where you're like, this is so good, I'm loving it, but I don't want to get to the end because when I get to the end, there's no more. That's how I felt reading this. And I was so excited to see, you know, uh, Superman go against Mongol, right? But you go deeper and deeper and deeper. You know, it's not about, all right, Superman's going to beat the crap out of Mongol. Like, that's what you expect. And I love that the book plays into that because that's what he expects. On some level, Superman's like, okay, I've got my outsiders. We're a team. We're going to go liberate War World. You know, we're going to go free every slave. That's what Superman says. That's the mission statement. And it just doesn't go that way. You know, like it's not a clean mission. It's not an easy mission. Um, but it's it's a joy to read. And you take – it's such a ride. You know, you take us through every emotion and it, it's a phenomenal, impressive story. It really, really is. Thank you, man. It's, um, I, I feel you on like not wanting it to be over. Um, I know how lucky I am to get to be a part of this gigantic shared universe. And, uh, you know, Dr. Manhattan says, and he said what he, what he would say, according to, to Silk Spectre, she's like, you know, and John would say nothing ends, not really. Um, and that is kind of part of the impetus behind Algren, the um the old god that I that I talked about in that book. Yeah. Um, the thing that they find, the thing that Superman uses to save Osel Ra, who's now named Red Sun in the comics, um, that is just one of seven of the god aspects of Algren. Um, I love the idea that there's only that that it takes that there's this one fragment of a god and it became a world, you know, like it takes seven worlds to make a to to make a god, you know. Um there's six more out there. And um it's not over. So uh just just know that. I'm not going anywhere. Um uh I, I it's a whole story that I really want to be told. In fact, have you been reading War Journal? Oh yeah. All right. Oh yeah. It's read, all there. All right, great. Read number six. It's about to hit. You'll feel you'll feel good about it. So it's as funny, far I, as like I, I don't want it to be over. Like, okay, cool. Read number six. <laughs> well, not over. And then keep reading. And that was the thing going from this to war journal was like, wow, there are so many connections. And it's not like you stopped, you know, telling this story. Uh, once the War World Saga ended, but like even transferring to another book, oh, here are these like characters, here are these like concepts, the Genesis, and you know, all these things are here still. So I love that you're kind of carving your own little space within the DC universe to play with, akin to many top level creators like Grant and Jeff Johns did it. So yeah, that's you're in good company doing that. Yeah, thank you. I, the War World Saga means a lot to me, man. I, I um I, I couldn't when I got the call to do Superman in action I just could not believe that I was getting that shot, but I was like, man, I'm not going to waste this. And I the very first thing I did for them was Superman Future State Worlds of War one and two, which is in the I think it's in the back. Those yeah. two and the House of L Future State issue those are in the back of that that compendium you just showed me. Um, those are like my mission statement on Superman. Like if I, if I get hit by a truck, I, back what I was thinking back then, I was like, if I don't live through this, this, this is my statement on what Superman is. Um, that's, that's like my, my manifesto on who Superman is. And I, honestly, actually, Tyler, this is a reference to, it, it was kind of a, um, it's kind of a homage to that Superman 400 issue. 
that that book that was that the uh, the, the anthology of which the theme was just Superman in the future, you know, when they told me they wanted me to write a story about Superman in the future, I'm like, man, I know exactly what I'm going to do. And it's a a two issue story. The first issue is kind of this treatise on what Superman meant to us after he's left earth. And then the next issue is what we mean to him, the way that we inspired him while he was inspiring us. He tells us like we read a Clark Kent op-ed article in which he celebrates this old um, this homeless guy who died, who most of us would walk past on the street and just kind of blow off as a loser, but who Superman held in the highest regard. You know, I want that to be like my, that's, that's the story I want to be remembered for Superman. If I had to be remembered like one little story, that's it. That's kind of, to me, that enca- encapsulates who Superman is and should be and who we should be. Mm-hmm. Um, House of L is kind of about his legacy, like a thousand years later, like what he means to the universe after he's gone. And and then the War World saga is that same is that same theme of what he means to us and what we mean to him. That's told in a much longer form, you know. Like the the seed was the future state story, and then everything that that the War World saga became was the much more fleshed out version of that thing. And um, I also wanted to introduce these much larger ideas that I get to continue to develop throughout my DC tenure, hopefully for years to come, like the. You know the the god of gods of the first world, Algren, and um, the Philosians and where they've been and where they're going, and Krill Ux and what he's going to do, and the the legacy of Mongol and the other the other war zones. There's all these war zone tribes now. I wanted I, I wanted war world to be more like complicated. Now I, just don't, I don't want to see another Death Star ripoff. It's like, oh no, it's war world. It's a big metal ball with guns sticking out of it. They're going to get us. You know, like, <laughs> I don't. I don't care about that. I want to care. I want a world that I do care about where it's, it's populated with people that came from other places and they're not the same. There's different, there's different enslaved races and some of them are dying out over time and <clears throat> other ones thrive. And, um, you know, the war zooms themselves are at war with each other because I mean, we are, we're on earth. Shouldn't we all be like one harmonious people? Like we're at war. We don't all speak the same language. So I want to see the war zooms that are in conflict. It was just a chance to tell a really much more interesting, more complicated story. Um, but I, at some point I was thinking about, <laughs> I, um, at some point I was, I was watching episode one, Star Wars episode one, Phantom Menace with my son. Don't judge me. He's like, we, uh, he went, you know, he's, <laughs> no, some people are like, don't they're like that movie's about beyond, beyond saving. Like, no, no, he wants to watch Star Wars. So anyway, we're watching Phantom Menace and um, there was a, there was a, a moment when they're they're talking about getting Anakin out of there or his mother, and one of them was like, "We didn't come here to save slaves or something like, or liberate slaves." I'm like, "The fuck, guys!" I I I just I remember how upset I was when I heard that. Like, you guys are the Jedi, and I remember how upset I was at the, in that moment when I first heard that, and I got that same kind of reaction when I was watching, and I'm like. I'm just kind of questioning my own psyche. I'm like, is this where world war world came from? It's like, is this why I did this? <laughs> Cause I remember how lame that was that Qui-Gon said that. Um, and I think, I, I think that, uh, that planted a little seed that's been festering for like for years and years. And that war world is kind of my answer to that, to that moment in episode one. One of the things I really enjoyed about world war world was that like, typically a Superman story is usually set on earth. So that dynamic between Superman and hum- in humanity can be played with on earth, but you took them out of earth entirely. Um, but you still dealt with that humanity aspect and more of Superman as a symbol, uh, that it could be. And I, and I really like that because a, I also just like alien stuff in the DC universe. So seeing more of that is just awesome. Um, no, thanks. but kind of taking him out of, I don't want to say a comfort zone, but just in terms of where he's been written most of the time recently, <laughs> it is that comfort zone and kind of giving him this whole new, uh, dynamic. I thought it was very. very yeah, interesting. thank you. I, it's um, to me, it was important to kind of understand the context of where Superman had been more recently in the stories. And Bendis had written uh, a lot of Daily Planet stuff, and there was, there'd been a lot of Jimmy and Lois and the supporting cast in it, like a lot. And uh, and also introduced some new characters in Daily Planet, and that was all very cool. Um, it did humanize Superman a lot, and I wanted to kind of do a do a 180 and really put the super back in Superman and give, tell this big sprawling space epic and show what he means to the, to the multiverse, you know? 
Um, so that was a good chance to do that. Part of that was also to let John kind of spread his wings as a character. So that I know that DC at large wanted to wanted to make him the Superman of Earth for a bit. <clears throat> um, and that was just a great opportunity to to take Superman off Earth and tell this Spartacus kind of story that I really wanted to tell. The story has um, like this really this fa high fantasy adventure vibe to it. Which I never, like, I, I never really saw that with Superman before. And that's a vibe that fits for me perfectly. Like, I was thinking about Dune. I was thinking about <laughs> Lord of the Rings. I was I was thinking about Star Wars, not that particular anecdote. But, like, you know, there are just certain uh, things here that give me the feeling of, of those kinds of stories. And then you mentioned Olgren, like, you gave Superman a quest, but then you made this boss god who will be the boss of Philip Kennedy Johnson's corner of the DC universe. And as a former World of Warcraft player, that type of shit sets my mind on fire. So I was having a blast reading this on so many different levels. And the idea of Superman as the champion of the oppressed, mm -hmm. I think that that is an absolute concept. And Superman is absolutely convicted that that is his role. That's what he's supposed to do in the universe. And in this war world story, you present everything in Superman's face that should say, no, hope, hope's not real. You don't work. Like the role you think you have doesn't work. And you can't do that here. Yeah. And Superman says, I can, and I will. And he says it in the face of every ally who says, we got it. We got to kill. We got to let these slaves go. You know, the one of the best scenes uh, for me was when Superman's speaking with Midnighter and he sort of says, uh, are their lives really worth more to you than ours? And Superman says, not more, but not less. Mm -hmm. And I got it right then and there. No, oh, thanks, man. Yeah, there's a there's a scene right after that, too, where the, the slave that they'd been fighting, the guy that had been, you know, putting them down in the in the arena. Um he hears that 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 exchange and then he <clears throat> he draws an s in the sand himself and he just he's like kind of mulling over the word hope after after midnighter leaves and you, you start to see the you know the seed of superman's influence kind of take hold among his enemies um i wanted to see how superman would deal with uh and how he would save people who don't want his help you know people who hate him hmm. um you know when i was writing that stuff we had a president who would who would punish blue states <clears throat> you know like when there's a national disaster um and you know california needed something you know be like you know no <laughs> it'd be like this is your fault you should have done this and this and this and um there was a there was a line in that same issue where um midnighter's like do you think we won this thing like super he tells superman like we're getting out of here and uh, he's like i'm not going anywhere and um you know he's so beaten he can barely speak and Midnighter's like, do you think you won? We just got our ass kicked out there and everyone cheered. You know, like, Leah's dead. And Superman's like, what should we do then? Abandon the ones who don't cheer for us? You know, yeah. is that what our heroes taught us? And um, that's how I feel, man. Like, we don't save them. We don't care about people because they cheer for us because they're on our team, you know? We save people because they need us. And Superman has a planet of people who need him and hate him. They don't think they need him. They think that Mongol is their Superman. Yep. But that doesn't mean that they need him any less. So, yeah, that was – it's an important moment. It was um, – that book is um, kind of – I've done some anti-human trafficking work in Baltimore. And you're all the time trying to find people or help people who don't think they need you. You know, they they don't think they have a pimp. They think they have a boyfriend. And they don't think they've been – enslaved they think they're just trying to save up enough money so they can get married and like they've they've lost their they've lost their connections with their families with their um their friends from school with their schools themselves they don't have a birth certificate or any kind of paper trail they're just like these people who were just lost in the sauce and their only thing that they have anymore at all is their connection to their slaver and if you try to take it they will kill you to defend it and I want to see how Superman will deal with a problem like that. You know, that's what War World's about. It, it feels like you you consistently lead with um, kindness in your stories. Like those are the those are the the things to be able to show to characters or to show to um, other people. 
and I think the the connection you just make there, right, is um, it, it it is a kindness that helps break the mental barrier because you have the physical constraints, fine, but that's only physical, and and you can you can take that off as much as you want. You can liberate, you can put them in where, wherever you they need to be, but that doesn't mean that they are free. And you, uh, I like the way that you position that in your writing is um, the the breaking boundaries is breaking the mindset and sort of switching on that. And I think uh, I, I personally agree that kindness and, and goodwill and benefit towards others is probably the most effective way to be able to communicate that because they need to know that there's somebody out there, regardless of whether or not they respect you or whether or not they agree with you that is willing to be as kind and as benevolent, maybe benevolent is too strong a word, as Superman. He's, he's indifferent to your suffering because he does not think suffering should exist in the world. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. There's a, what you said about um, having to break that mindset. That is that is the hardest part of what Superman's doing up there. Like even after he saves the super twins and brings them back home later as his own children, spoilers <laughs> for anyone who has not read the book, sorry. <laughs> it's been out for a while you should have got should have got the book that's um, right tell them so when uh when the super twins are on earth later you see the kids going to sleep they can't they can't sleep in the bed you know they're on the floor still and um and otho ra uh star child she still sleeps with she like wraps up like t-shirts and wraps around her her, her wrists as a chain because she can't sleep without it um you know she's take she's the older one she's the one that kind of they call people call them the super twins because it's just that's they assume they're twins, but she's actually a year older. So she's been the one um, kind of protecting her younger brother all that time. So he's a little more fun in games, a little more like John was when he was that age. But but she is a little harsher, a little um, she's a little more fighty, I guess, than he is a little more like I dare you and mm. just aggressive and angry. Um, and she there's still a little more of Mongols uh, brainwashing in her than there is in her brother. And that's, I wanted to express that through that chain that she wears and how, how angry she gets about stuff. I, I read, I started your reading your run after the war world saga had ended. So when I saw that, I didn't understand the full context. And now I'm like, Oh shoot, I got to go back and read the whole fucking thing because there's stuff after war world that I read that now will have a different impact now that I've read this. So you know, you really made a run over the course of 30 plus issues that demands, you know, um, to be read in full because it's everything is important. No, and all you, of man. these. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll put a lot of thought into it for sure. There is a there's also a trade that came out before War World Saga called The One Who Fell. And and that also I kind of wanted those issues in there, too. But they, they were not. The book is already real long <laughs> and the uh, the collection and they. I kind of wanted these other issues in there too, but that would have made it like stupid long. So they're, they're still their own thing. The one who fell contains two arcs. There's a, a two issue arc with Phil Hester called uh, the golden age. <clears throat> and it's a story which we see Superman and the grown up John mm. um, fighting off this weird threat. That's like, there's, there's this interdimensional rift that keeps opening up in, in space. And these, these gigantic things keep coming through. And they keep like Superman and John go up there and keep throwing them back across <clears throat> and trying to keep Earth safe. Um, and they keep coming back through again and again. They're getting stronger. And Superman's kind of getting getting torn up a little bit. He's getting like radiation poisoned, but John is okay for whatever reason. And um, John is having a hard time seeing Superman get, uh, you know, get hurt. And Superman's telling him like it's going to be okay, and he tells the story about seeing Pa Kent fall off his ladder and hurt himself when he was a kid, and just talking about the golden age when you're when the kid thinks that your parents are going to live forever and they have every answer and everything's great, and then they see their parents fall or do something foolish, and it kind of breaks them breaks them of that. Where like now suddenly they feel unprotected, and then but that's what gives kids a chance to kind of step forward out of it and become better and stronger and kind of surpass us in a lot of ways. There's a little two issue story that had a, a memory with Pa Kent that I feel like mattered. And then there was a three issue story that set up Tom Taylor's John run mm -hmm. um, in which it was just a, it's like a letter from Superman to his son, John, uh, after he had left and to go on to, to go to war world, um, just reminding John that he's up to this, that he's, he's, 
he's up to being Superman. John's doubting himself, doesn't think he's Superman. He thinks there's only one Superman and John can never fill those shoes. And Superman writes him a letter reminding him of this time that they had this adventure off in space where John saved the day. And um, those those two stories both kind of set up War World too. So if you want the full experience, The One Who Fell is also a good read, in my opinion, as far as what it what it sets up. You get like a little one, like a, a couple of pages of of Mongol and his and his crew a little bit. Um, All right, well, yeah. now I got to get that too. <laughs> it's uh if if you have the if anybody who's listening and has the DCU app, um, it's actually broken out with that included, so you get that full uh that full continuous run. Oh, oh, wow. awesome! That's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. Now's a good time to reiterate the fact that if you want to get started reading any of Philip Kennedy Johnson's uh big two books that we're talking about today, whether that be Action Comics, whether that be Green Lantern War Journal or Incredible Hulk, the volume one of any of those, you're going to be giving away one of those uh here towards the end of the conversation with Phil. Um, we want to make sure that, you know, look, great comics need to be read. And there are a lot of people who love books but can't necessarily afford them. You're looking for your start with, you know, books that you're hearing great things about. We want to help you. So just leave a comment. And everybody that leaves a comment is going to have a chance to win. So we'll get to, we'll get back to that just a little bit later. That's awesome. Um, you guys do that. Yeah. It's, it's important to do. Thanks for your and generosity. The listeners are helping us. You heard the Patreon list. Those are people supporting us. We got to give back. It wouldn't, well, it's it wouldn't be worth doing if we're not. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about Mongol because you don't present a character throughout the entirety of war world who is only to be viewed as evil. I found more complexity than that because this is not the same Mongol that Superman knows. This is a new Mongol and there's a line of Mongols. And I don't know enough about uh, the lore to know if that was something that you introduced. Is is that a new concept or did that pre did that predate? That you? is actually a concept that, well, we, okay, we've known even before Bendis' time, we have seen, there's been two different Mongols up till now. Okay. Um, there's the one that is in most of the stories that we know, but there was also that Mongol's father before that. <clears throat> like, so back in the day, when we see that really old story where we first introduced the concept of War World and Mongols there and John Johns is there. That is technically the current Mongol's grandfather. And then later we see a lot of stories with the Mongol that most of us knew, like the one from the Mongol from um, the death of Superman return and all that. That's, that's the next generation. And then in Bendis's run, he established that Mongol is himself of the war zone race, like the war zones that we, that we hear about on war world. Those are the same race as Mongol. He's just the biggest and baddest one. Um, and we established that every Mongol passes that title on to his son when the son kills him, basically. Like it's every every Mongol since time out of mind has murdered his father and then taken the title of Mongol. Um I and we and we see the latest killing happen in Mongol's run towards the end of, of uh sorry, towards the end of Bendis's run, we see Mongol get killed and then new Mongol takes over. I see. Um <clears throat> And that kind of gave me an opening. I, I wanted to, again, I'm, I wanted to be aware of the context in which my run begins. And there had been a fair bit of Mongol in there, but we hadn't seen this new guy. And I thought that was a good opening to um, to kind of make Mongol more of a threat. Because, I mean, he was used in the past as kind of a punching bag. Like when John comes back from his um, from his jaunt with his, his grandfather and, and comes back aged up after everything that happened with uh, Ultraman and everything. Superman is so angry at the lost years, the, the time that he lost with his son, he goes and he goes and finds Mongol and just beats him down just because he needs it. Um, that's not a threatening villain, you know, like I, I needed him to be legit. So, I mean, visually, people kind of they kind of think of Mongol, Thanos, Darkseid, all kind of the same, same big one dimensional scary dude. Um. And uh, whenever that's whenever that's the case in comics, now that I'm actually making the donuts like behind the scenes, whenever I see that kind of thing where they're so indistinct that they are mistaken for one another, that's not good enough. Mm. You know, I fans deserve better than that. 
War World deserves better than to be cons- be like another Death Star thing, and Mongol deserves better than to be considered like a a lesser Dark Side. Like I want to know why he's different than Dark Side. Um, Absolutely. So plus there, I mean, also Superman stories are meant to be um, kind of a a chance to talk about things that matter in real life through the medium of comic books. I mean, from the very beginning, like in Action Comics number one. Superman is named the champion of the oppressed. I mean, people got when when uh, when DC started messing with the truth, justice, and American way thing. A lot of people got real butthurt about that. Um, I guess I didn't. I mean, they expected me to be really angry as an active duty soldier. They thought that I was going to be super pissed about that. But that title was something that came up much later in Superman's run, and it went through some changes too. I mean, it wasn't always that. There were different iterations of it that didn't have the American way thing in there. So to me, that was something that was kind of added on later as sort of a propaganda thing that I don't really, I'm, I'm not emotionally attached to that phrase. Um, from Action Comics number one, he was the champion of the oppressed and they expressed him in that way in the pages. You know, he was taken down like political corruption and domestic abusers and, you know, it, it was stuff that that mattered in real life. He was He was kind of punching those things in the face in his comic book. And um, I wanted to see that kind of stuff now. So when I I had a chance to make Mongol more interesting and more um, more relevant, honestly, I wanted to see that I wanted to I wanted the story that tells us the dangers of hero worship and politics, <laughs> and um, and uh, you know the you know the dangers of this cult of personality and all of my my own baggage from my anti-human trafficking work. There's a chance to tell like meaningful stories here with this guy and also show where he comes from. And I don't want a guy that's just evil just because. I that's a that's a trope that I just don't want to see in a comic book. I don't I don't need him to be trying to destroy the world or rule the universe just for just because he's a jerk. That's not good enough. So we had a chance to kind of show why he wants what he wants, where he came from show that he thinks he's the hero of his own story like everyone else does like the way all of us do all of us think that we're the hero of our own story nobody thinks they're the bad guy even if they clearly are um so that was kind of my my challenge for war world for uh well for war world but also for mongol like how do i make mongol interesting and also set him apart dark side is a legit god he is a, a force of nature you can't it's not something that you punch in the face um this guy i wanted him to be the the opposite like the polar opposite of that of that phrase the champion of the oppressed if champion of the oppressed is is one side of the spectrum the other side would be this intergalactic slaver who is whose entire identity is wrapped up in the in the concept of dominance and that's where the um that's where that chain that we that is in all the iconography like if you look at the uh, the throne room on war world there are chains in the in the floor that all lead towards the throne and he is the one that they call the one who holds all chains like everyone on war world has a chain except him he's the one who holds them all um you know all the um and that's how they establish dominance between them even the slaves they show their dominance by how long their chain has become and how many people they've killed um I wanted dominance to be the thing that ties the culture on war world together. The way that um, the entire culture of Dune is based around water scarcity, how that defines Mm -hmm. everything about them, their language, their religion, their clothing, everything. Dominance does that on war world. And uh, Mongol is the end of that whole, he's like the, the apex of that pyramid. Um, So yeah, there was just a lot of, there were a lot of chances to really define what Mongol is and make him his own thing that nobody ever mistakes for anyone else ever again. And having a new Mongol suddenly was a chance to do that because we we have all these stories already with Mongol that didn't really do what I was doing, but now he's dead and there's a new one. So that was a chance to kind of rewrite that book as it were. It's, it's incredible. I, I honestly I, I have way, way more notes on that subject than we will ever have time for. But <laughs> needless to say, uh, I love all of that. Jeff, do um, another show then. Exactly. There you go. You're always welcome. Thanks, um, man. You're welcome. Let's 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 let the listeners have their say a little bit. Um, Want to make sure we get some questions in. We've got quite a few. Um, oh, great. So, you know, if you feel like you just want to just run through it, that's totally cool. Um, no, let's do it. These. Um. Tyler, you want to you want to go for it? 
Yeah, I want to actually bring one up that we had in the live chat actually first. Um, sure. Kush, Kushik Raja uh, asked this question, and it was right before I think you answered it, but but I think uh, we can shed some more light on it. Uh, he asked, uh, when you decided to do the Fire of Olgren lore, did you have a full-on plan? And since your run on Superman has ended, how will you folk, How will the focus shift to Green Lantern as a protagonist for that lore? Oh, man, read issue six. <laughs> it's, just about, <laughs> it's just about to hit. Um, oh, God, what can I say? I haven't said it without spoiling the shit out of everything. Um, I've got a ton of notes about, about Algren, about what the seven aspects are. I think, let's see, I can talk a little bit about the about the lore that's already kind of in the book. Um, so I'm one of the cool things about DC is that it, it's it's the story of gods among us. Like I feel like the the big difference between DC and Marvel is that Marvel is about the world outside your door, and DC is a is a modern day mythology about gods among us. You know, like I um when you get characters like Wolverine and the thing and um, Dr. Strange and Spider-Man, especially Spider-Man is like the, the poster child of this concept. They're heroes, but they're also, they also have complicated little intricacy. I mean, they still have to do their laundry and still get bad breath and they still do dumb, they make dumb mistakes and they, they're like us, you know, they're like, they're like us. Um, and they're a mythology too, but they're a mythology almost in the, the Norse gods kind of way where they play tricks on each other. They do dumb shit and they have to go back and fix it. And they're like, they wake up drunk and they're like, oh man, what did I do last night? And like no, the stories of Norse mythology are very much the stories of big bumbling idiots like we are. And DC is more, I mean, the, the Greek pantheon was, they were deeply flawed too. Like they're yeah they have like this rape problem like they're, they're like a the greek the greek pantheon is also deeply flawed but there's also they're more like thematic than than um than the norse gods like you have the, the god of the underworld batman you have the god of the heavens superman you have the you know the goddess of wisdom you know athena you know diana to us and we you know the the messenger god the flash and the god of, the, the god of light helios which is, who is green lantern and they're so clearly there's like there's this thematic pantheon of gods in the DC universe. It's just they they're so much bigger than us. Um, and it was so interesting to see Bendis write Superman um, because he came from that world. He was like an architect at Marvel, and he came over and he he humanized Superman in very similar ways to the way he would have humanized somebody like Daredevil or you know, Iron Fist or one of the Avengers. Um. But Superman is not a guy that has to do laundry and, you know, makes dumb mistakes. Superman shows us the way, you know, Superman is, is a God among us. And I want him, I don't ever want to show, I don't want to watch Superman and Lois and see him and him. And I don't want to see him make some big misstep as a father and, you know, get wine drunk with Lois and like do something dumb. I don't want to judge Superman's parenting. You know, I want, I want him to show me the way. You know, I want a Superman that inspires me, makes me like shake my fist, like yes, I want to, I want to be what that is. You know, um, it's aspirational. Yeah, yeah. So I, when I approach DC books, I'm thinking of it in those terms. I, when I'm writing a DC book, I'm thinking of it in terms of I'm writing a modern mythology that is going to outlive me by a thousand years. I'm, I'm just, I'm one very, very small part of this mythology that has been around for nearly a hundred years already and was going to is going to live on way past any of the writers and artists that are part of it um so that's kind of why i wanted to tie it in a little closer to kirby's fourth world where like we're you know one one cool thing about dc is that the the new the new testament of the dc universe is the new gods like they're alive and they're among us and i, I would personally like to see more interaction between the dc characters the justice league characters and all the others I would like to see them interact more with characters of the fourth world. I want to see more interaction with that, with that part of, of the DC canon. And um, the fourth world suggests that there have been three others. And I wanted to kind of take it down to the, down to the bones and see something from like way back the beginning of, of creation. Um, something that we can kind of build up to in the way that, that feels long and lasting and adding to the lore the way that the dark Phoenix saga did um, for, you know, the X-Men universe or 
um, the Infinity Gauntlet or, you know, Secret Wars that we're going out in space. Like there's all these things that have that we've seen take place in, in the comics lore that just made the world seem so much bigger and older, but also newer. And introducing Olgren, God of Gods, um, and the knowledge that War World is just one small piece of what Algren is, it was a way to do that. Where War World is not just a big metal ball. There's actually there's stone underneath all that. This place is really old. And War World itself is this thing that grew out of some little device. It's actually just a puzzle box to protect this little device, this thing that is just one small part of this ancient mystery. So fucking cool. Come on. How are you not reading this stuff, guys? Everybody has to get on this. Ugh. So yeah, there's a lot more to show. I've, I know where the other six pieces are. And um, hopefully I'm going to live long enough to do it all. <laughs> but if not, I've got the notes. Don't worry. Pass them on. If I if something happens, I'll, the notes are there. It'll be okay. Protect PKJ at all costs. You heard <laughs> it here first. We got to get those stories. Um, let's, let's hit the next listener question, Tyler, if you're ready. Yeah, so uh, Dan Trudeau asked, uh, does he ha- uh, do you have specific inspirations you draw from for the stories you write? For example, the War World Saga has Echoes of Ancient Rome, which, there you go. Uh, and did you deliberately plan that, or did that just come out of your head? Um, yeah, I mean, the inspiration for War World Saga, or for War World, the, the place, is that, is that what the question means? Like, inspiration for the War World, the War World or for the story? He said I saga, kind of so I think I think it's mostly the story is how I'm. Reading. Okay, okay, yeah. Well, like I was saying, it, it's it draws mostly from my experiences anti human trafficking, but uh, and also just modern day issues like political stuff and um, things that I think matter. I always try to tell stories about things that deeply matter to me, and I just I just dress them up in genre trappings that make it fit whatever the whatever the the story in the canon is that I'm that I'm writing in. Um. Gosh, what else? Um, I mean, it does come out of my own head. As far as like the culture on War World and things like that, that all came, that all kind of came from me starting from a very basic, like a theme or a basic idea and kind of answering every question with a question and let, giving it permission to just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Like um, I started with, uh, Scott Snyder told me one time that he, th- he feels like every nemesis of a character should be the, the, antithesis to that character in some way it should be either the polar opposite or preferably should be like almost the, the exact like that the hero but with some little twist like they 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 almost became the same person but there was like one you know one bad day or one little change and they became this villain instead and um that's kind of what mongol is to superman he is the polar opposite of what superman is so i started with champion of the oppressed i turned i, I turned that around and made a character that is the opposite of that, the character wrapped up in dominance. And then, okay, so, okay, so he's a war zone. So dominance is the key. Like Undune is about water scarcity. Here it's going to be about dominance. So what does that culture look like? Um, and then as I, as I made up these different tribes of war zones and how the, how they're, you know, what war world would look like and how they would be fighting and kind of started to make up the languages and everything at all. Um, I don't know. It's like answer every question with another question and the world just gets bigger until it starts to feel real. But it all comes from that, that seed of championing the oppressed. And then we, you know, so we need to see oppressed people, but also the, the person who, whose existence depends on that oppression. Uh, Another one here from Amin Perez. Uh, before delving into Superman, which version of the character did you feel mo- the most connected to? Um, Star. I was I uh, All Star Superman by Grant Morrison and Frank Wiley is pretty great, mm-hmm. and I um, and Grant writes so differently than me. Um, I I I really admire how. Grant is just this bottomless font of creativity, you know, like he, I mean, I just can't. Yeah. It, it's just nuts. How the, the directions in which uh, that mind goes, man, like I, um, I, I really tried to, I, I usually my, I try to make my worlds feel real, you know, like in a way is as crazy as it gets, it still feels plausible and real. 
Grant is not bothered with such things. Grant writes, he um, Grant really embraces the absurdity of comics, you know, and just just really embraces it and goes goes all in. And I really admire that. But there are also these really beautiful, um, you know, just these great lines and aspirational moments in that run that that uh, I tried to to draw upon. I mean, the 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 easiest example to to give would be the one where he saves the jumper. Um, yep. but there are other other moments too in that book that are really great. Even just the opening, like there's like in the uh, the uh, inside cover, there's a great line about like it's our actions that define us. And I I don't know, Grant just really gets Superman. I got to go to Glasgow, um, a couple of years ago, and Grant and I hung out, and we just were just a couple of dudes just, you know, getting getting lit and talking about Superman in the bar, and for for a long time, it was it was a really great conversation i loved it the yeah, it was it was so cool to hear grant talk about superman yeah, that perspective that just like that view yeah, yeah. sean, sean has a it, it's off screen at the moment but there's a there's a shrine that you can't really see that's where the glowing lights actually coming from over there oh cool i awesome. don't know if i would be here if it wasn't for grant's run on batman so that's oh, why yeah. yeah that's great stuff too uh next one here is from atomic hound Thanks for the many terrific stories you have already provided us. You built the culture around War World and then the family family dynamic when Superman returned to Earth. Was either more satisfying to you personally? Was either more challenging? I'm sorry, I'll ask you for just a second. What are the what, either of what? The uh the culture around war war world, uh mm -hmm. the family dynamic when Superman returned. Was there one that was a bit more satisfying to build out? Either that, oh, that culture or that family? Um Man, they're such different experiences. I, um, you know, it was building up the family thing was more difficult just because of the, 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 uh, the page count constraints. Like there were, there were a lot of, of, uh, of characters for the Superman family. And I wanted them all to get some kind of an arc or something to do that mattered in the pages of that book. And there are just so many characters. And I had so many, so few pages each issue to do that in. So that was, it was hard. It was hard to get them all in there. Um, I wish, I have a lot more I would love to say about every one of those characters. So I don't feel like I got to really, I almost want, I almost wanted it to be two different series where I could take like a few over here and a few over there and really flesh out those characters more. Um, fleshing out the culture of War World. They gave me a long, they gave me a long run on War World, which was great. Um I kind of cheated a little bit as as we went along. Like the the senior editor on the book left, and another person came in, and I kind of moved the goalpost a little bit when the new person came in. I was like May, no, 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 it's July. <laughs> and then and then that happened again. Like another editor came on. Um, because I, you know, again, same thing with uh, the authority. I felt obligated to use the entire authority team that Grant had built. It just made a ton of sense that. Superman would be building this team to go with him because the Justice League turned him down. So obviously he would take these new characters with him up there. And there's a lot of them. And I, they all had to have their arc. They couldn't, I didn't want anyone to be up there just for, just for pretty. So I, um, I had to make sure they all got their due as well. So that's, you know, it was, I like the idea of seeing Superman fighting in the arena and inspiring everyone and slowly building this movement around Balena Gaul, the unblooded sword and how they, they, um, they're proud of their chains, but towards the end, they start to see the broken chain as his symbol. Um, and that, that takes time to do. So while he's doing that and, you know, using his sword only to break chains and never flesh, you got Midnighter in this, in the alleys, killing his ass off, <laughs> trying to, <laughs> trying to, and you see how the, um, how the, the movement also kind of, kind of takes shape because of what Midnighter's doing without Superman's say so, you know, I kind of like that idea seeing uh seeing a couple of the other characters become his unmade and uh, seeing um seeing light ray become you know her version of the the black racer kind of you know like so another tie-in with the fourth world um there was just a lot to do up there so i am um, honestly i i think as far as just satisfaction and just fun that i was having i would have to say building the culture on war world there are all these things that that uh, we got to do on that story um there was one. Had, really, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. There, there was one really fun moment, and um, and this is still during Daniel Samperi's run. It might, it might have been his last issue, where, um, yeah, I think it was like ten thirty six, where they show up on War World and they they head straight to the arena. They're following this 
this road of like crucified Philosian bodies that model has put there to um to get under his skin to like make him rush in and we see these uh we see these war zoons outside the arena next to this big mongol statue um they in the first pass of the of the art those vehicles that are driving look just like cars basically and what the note was like uh these like straight up like american cars like let's we should make these look more you know more unusual and we did but when they came back again they still looked basically like cars but with some differences and i was like you know what instead of me i don't really like giving notes like that be like no this thing that you did make it different so instead i was like why would it look like that and i kind of developed this um this whole backstory that i still want to show someday in which um like a scouting party from war world explored earth like a couple of generations ago as a, as a possible target um, to be in, to be conquered and enslaved and all that. And so they went, they sent the scouting party of war zooms to earth. They grab a fair number of, of uh, earthlings and earth technology and bring it back to war world. And they prepare this invasion and then they find some other easier target. It's closer by and they kind of earth kind of gets ignored. But then because of that, there are, there are, you know, earthling slaves on war world that we don't actually see in the war world saga. And they have little bits of, of our old tech. So they have example, they have like old um, things that look like muscle cars on the outside, but they've the, under the hood is completely different, but they've got, um, but this one particular tribe, that's a little bit tech heavy, like this, this Mad Max kind of tribe of war zoons on war world have things that look kind of like, American cars up there, but even though that they run on completely different tech. Um, so there's that, that kind of built, that kind of planted the seeds for this whole tribe of war zooms that I still want to show someday. And there's other stuff like that too. Like um, when they first, in that same issue, when they first land, there's this, there's this uh, big like bed of crystal with these two, these two giant creatures kind of embedded in them. And that's like a trophy that Mongol built himself. These two, like this brother and sister, alien rulers from this planet that they conquered and they and he put them he like buried them in this cult as a, in this like courtyard sort of thing as like a as an fu to that planet um stuff like that that we don't have chance we don't have a chance to actually you know talk about every single little visual thing that's in the book but uh but they're there there's a lot of love put in those things to make that world look real you know stuff like that just really this brings me a lot of satisfaction and there's stories that I would love to come back and tell one day. Um, you had me trying to speak the language. So success. I've got, I've got the glossaries. <laughs> like there's, there's, there's multiple war zoom languages that I've got some like guides to when they, um, cool. went during that first arc, the war world rising arc, when, um, they've got some, they've got some war zooms in captivity in Atlantis. And that one guy is like cussing out Superman. That's he's really talking. Like I can I can tell you what he's saying if you if you want. I he's, sure uh, do. Let's see. I'd have to I'd have to I'd have to pull up the script. And he calls him like Mbana Umba or something, which means milk drinker. Like he's he's calling him a he's calling him a, a baby, basically. Uh or like a like a like a helpless kid that anyone could just kill, like without any effort. It's like it's uh, it's like a it's a big slam on War World. Um, I'd have to pull up the, the original translation. I can look it up while we're talking here. <laughs> I just love that you have all of this information. Wild. Yeah. Uh, kale confirmed milk drinker. Yeah. Uh, we, we're, we're, we're over time. Uh, I don't want to go too far. So let's just get like, if we can just get like one more question in. Yeah, sure. Um, and then, and then we'll close. Uh, Sean, I'm going to get the, the other one you put in the, in the chat. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Mike Elliott, his question was, uh, I've dug, dug a lot of your work so far. Keep it coming. Generally, I'm wondering about the inspirations for the last God series as it turned some common fantasy tropes around. And if you feel fantasy is an undeserved genre in comics and if you have any future fantasy plans. I mean, yeah, I mean, so we, yeah, we did the last God and, um, that was with me and Ricardo Federici. Yep. We both love it. We both want to do a lot more and, um, they're kind of keeping they're kind of keeping Ricardo and me hopping and other stuff. 
like they can they can make more money having us write and draw Superman and Batman than they can on our own stuff. But um, if they ever if we end up, if we ever end up doing an exclusive thing with me and them, my first stipulation will be more Last God. Like I I want more of that. For those who were looking for that book, it's actually it's called the Fellspire Chronicles now. Like the, the original title was The Last God, book one of the Fellspire Chronicles. And then due to some kind of a, a copyright thing, now it's just called the Fellspire Chronicles, book one. So you can find it under one of those two titles. Um, but yeah, when I first got to do that book, I was like, are you sure? Like to my editor, my editor was the one that encouraged me to pitch a, a high fantasy thing. I'm like, man, do you think we can get this across the plate? The last fa high fantasy thing I think I saw from DC was like Warlord or something. And um, they're like, yeah, I think we can do it. It was going to be a Vertigo book before Vertigo closed, and then it became mm. DC Black Label. Um, but and it was really fun. And I mean, we started to see some other things in comics, and like after that, there's like there was the D and D book, and Jim Zub is doing great things on Conan, and there's and before that, Marvel was doing great stuff with Conan. I bought the shit out of that Jason Aaron Conan run. I thought it was great. That's good stuff. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I mean, I think there is definitely a place for high fantasy in comics. I've got this creator own fantasy thing that I'm that I want to do soon. I need to get the I need to get the bandwidth to actually make the thing. But I've got um, <clears throat> it's kind of like a post apocalyptic Camelot story oh. that I am insanely excited about. I love writing like uh, old. um, Like epic poetry type stuff like Beowulf type things writing things in uh, iambic pentameter and stuff. In fact, if you, um, I mean, if you read that future state house of L issue, that's basically fantasy too. I mean, I write, uh, I'm writing, um, iambic pentameter, like couplet all the way through that, that issue that, that's meant to make it feel like this ancient poem, like the fall of an, of an ancient house, you know? Um, go back to that one. So, I mean, even when I was writing, you know, quote unquote, sci-fi, um with War World Saga and other things at DC and Marvel, I'm really writing high fantasy. I mean, it's that's that's what I think it needs to be. It, it's yeah. so it's so funny how like it's so clear. Green Lantern War Journal. Oh yeah, sci-fi. This dude has a lantern ring. It's so cool. And then all of a sudden he's in this crazy ass world. There's a Cthulhu arm, there's the Revenant Queen, there's all this fantasy stuff. And it's just like this beautiful fusion of two genres that you know most of us love. Thanks. I love doing it. Yeah, here I just I'll just pull up House of L. I know not everyone caught on to this, but like here's so you know, you guys know I'm a pentameter, like front you see a lot of it in um in Shakespeare. Like um, mm -hmm. um two houses, both alike in dignity, uh in fair Verona, where we lay our scene. It's like these ten syllable lines with uh, the second, like all the even numbers are accented in fair Verona, where we lay our scene. That's kind of the the rhythm of it. I wrote House of L that way. So like here at the beginning of Future State House of L, it says, as falls a house that stood a thousand years, remember ye the peerless House of L that sets the yellow sun whose strength was theirs. Now here the final tale is left to tell. Remember fabled victories proudly won and not ignoble death that now awaits. Think on valorous labors nobly done and not the fell invaders at the gates. And that goes all the way through. Um, because I, I, I wanted it to feel like you're reading Beowulf or the Battle of Camelon where Camelot fell or, you know, stuff like that. I just want it to feel timeless and like you're seeing this epic thing. It can't be enough to just see laser beams and shit blown up. It needs to, it needs to feel like it matters and it's going to outlive us, you know? Uh, we need you on more of uh, Etric and the Demon, too. <laughs> oh, my God. Writing him is so fun. <laughs> I, I, I love writing Etric. That was kind of my... When I found out I was leaving the book, I was like, all right, I got to get some metric in here. Constantine. Too. <laughs> yes. Love Snuck it. that in. Had to. Man, this was so fun. I'm going to read one more. Their oh. banner is the first to catch the light. As golden dawn illumines silver moon. The flag of truth and justice burning bright. Now trod beneath the heavy heel of doom. Oh. Mm -hmm. And then uh, um, Scott Godlusky does this amazing spread this, this double page spread where like the, the S shield is the top and you see the house of L fighting these, like this, uh, this squad of doomsdays and oh my God, it just, to see this, this layout take the shape of the S shield is just the dopest thing. Let me see if I can, I, I think I might, I, I, it doesn't always work. The screen doesn't always work, but it's, that's it. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. 
Nice, dude. And, and even as you're writing Green Lantern right now, like the Lantern Oath is similar yep. uh, in a way. Right. Yeah. Like I exactly. Yeah. I got to write the oath in that other world. And um, and it, yeah, it was different. There yes. it is. Incredible. Incredible stuff. Let's let's do the giveaway. Let's do the giveaway while we still have Philip. Let's let's make sure we get that in the hands of one lucky listener. Tyler, take it away. All right, I'm just gonna click a button, see what happens. Here we go. Yeah. It's a total randomizer. Okay. We got Catherine as the the winner. Let's go. That's All perfect. Right. Congratulations, Catherine. You are the winner of your choice of Action Comics, Green Lantern, Incredible Hulk. Last God, anything that Philip has done, if it's got a volume one and you want it, we'll talk. We'll talk. We'll get that in your hands. Okay. Thank you, Philip, so much for joining us. Um, I I really, really, really appreciate your time. You're so gracious. I had a blast. I'm, I'm sure I speak for the audience and the rest of the pals when I say this was incredible. Hopefully we get to do it again because I know personally I have a million questions. I'm sure the listeners do. I'm sure the rest of the pals do. So thank you so much. Um, is there anything you want to leave the listeners with before we close? Um, my let's see, yeah. I mean, look me up online, man. I'm on I'm on Facebook, Twitter, to all of Twitter's descendants <laughs> after it kind of uh, imploded. Yeah. Um, let's see, Instagram. I have a website, philipkennedyjohnson.com, where I try to keep my stuff updated. Um, yeah, my my ongoing books right now are the incredible hulk and green lantern war journal and um a lot of my stuff is still available in trade i'm, do, I'm doing a creator own book right now that's going to be available soon yep. and i've got another big announcement coming from dc and another one from marvel later in the year so lots of really cool stuff coming so thanks again for all the support i can't thank the readers enough for all the support that they continue to give thanks to guys like you for putting the word out there um yeah, man. I just love the comic space. I love comic people. I love that we're all in for love of the game. So I hope to not go anywhere for a long time. We love your comics. Thank you for making them. Of course, man. It's Thank great to see you guys again. Likewise. We're going we're gonna to close out with Phil off camera. We'll be right back. Live viewers, just hang out with us. Quick moment. We'll be back. We're back. We're back. Um, incredible. Incredible. Philip Kennedy okay. Johnson's just absolutely amazing. Um, sorry to, you know, whoever's questions we didn't get to. I know there were a lot in the chat um, and it's just tough, you know, um, but incredible, incredible conversation. I mean, we, we hardly even were able to get out of 
talking about Superman because yeah, so much. There's just so much there with that. Like I was dying to talk about Hulk. We couldn't even get to it. What? We have we have a part two ready now. Next yeah. one. <laughs> In the as, bag. as Hulk's arcs continue, uh, we got stuff to talk about because I I I'm loving that Hulk run. So yeah, it's insane. And and the the sort of difference, like the the artistic difference, right? One being horror, one being this high fantasy. Like, how does your mind switch? That that was to be my first question. Just like, what do you do to click it? Yeah. Well, I feel like the fantasies uh, in the it's horror book too. Yeah. He's doing sure. it everywhere. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, yeah, chat. You guys were amazing. Great questions. Uh, even the ones we didn't get to. You guys are fantastic. Um, thank you so so much for hanging in there for that reason. You know, we didn't set a like goal. We didn't, we didn't, I didn't stress likes, but I do want to make sure we get a game in, have a little fun before we get out of here. We don't have okay. like news and stuff like that, but. Um, I mean, we're at 27. If we had a, if we had a likes goal, y'all crushed it. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So yeah, uh, we can run a quick gate. Tyler, are you geared up uh, for that? You want to vamp for like two minutes? Yeah, 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 of course. Um, <laughs> so if you have not read War World. Mm. I highly recommend that you pick up this compendium. I really, really do. Uh, a lot of a lot of the people that are in our community on the Discord have been talking about this book for years. Some of them are in the chat right now. And um, you were right. It's an yep. incredible piece of work. If you're a Superman fan, you need to read this because it will remind you of why. And if you're not, you need to read it because it will make you one. That, I was so impressed in how, like, his, how much of his life experience bleeds into the pages and you know a, a good writer tends to be able to mix their experience into whatever the art is you know they're um it's an expression of themselves in, in a lot of cases and for him to be able to take uh i think somebody had mentioned it earlier in the chat i think it was catherine just like being able to take something that is so um heavy in real life and be able to create an aesthetic solution to be able to describe that thing um, yeah is inc frankly amazing Catherine says, yo, thank you to you guys and to PKJ for coming through. This is a creator that's inspired me for real. I'm happy to hear that, and I'm sure he would be too. Um, you, could, you could tell that he just really, really, really loves comics yeah. deeply. Yeah. And, and whenever yeah. – oh, go ahead. Sorry, Sean. I was going to let you know I'm ready. Whenever you're ready. Cool. All right, yeah, let's hit it. Let's, let's, uh, let's play a quick game. Let's hit Spin that wheel. wheel. What do we got? What do we got? Somewhere good. Buy or sell? Oh, ooh, very nice, very nice. We got a got a little cozy buy or sell today uh, to to close out this epic interview with Philip Kennedy Johnson. So the buy or sell for this week. This is a question that I have actually debated with people more than once. So we're gonna do it here. <laughs> <laughs> buy or sell on. Captain America, Cyclops, or Batman as a leader. Of course, these individuals lead the Avengers, the X-Men, and the Justice League, respectively. Who do you think is the best leader? Can you – what are the options again? Batman, Cap, and Cyclops. Batman, Cap, oh, interesting, interesting. And so the other one would no longer participate. Mm. Yes, yeah, so you buy on one, you sell on the others. I'm gonna have a hot take here. I'm buying Cyclops. Ooh. And here's why. Here's why. Captain America is very much a symbolic person. He does what is seen seems to be the correct thing, and, and what he feels to be the correct thing. Uh, Batman will do whatever he wants. And I think Cyclops is a good mix between the two. I think Cyclops has done the things that people shouldn't do. You know, we have our Bendis era Cyclops leading into uh, his death in uh, uh, IVX. Uh, but he's also like the guy to lead the the, the strike mission team. Um, I think it's a, maybe a, a clarifier needs to be here in terms of team as in like, is this a team that's doing a mission or is this like just the team as a whole? Um it's a little tricky because some would say maybe Cyclops isn't the leader at some point because he just listens to commands and, and does it. Uh, and also, I just like Cyclops, so I'm picking Cyclops. I think 
sort of the opposite to that. Actually, not really, because I'm 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 thinking cap. I'm buying on cap because I think when it comes to leadership, you need a level of iconography. Like you need you need to be able to be the example and uh, a little propaganda. A little propaganda, yeah, yeah. I I think so. I I think it's uh, I think it's part of the leadership role because you have to as much as you you know do the work. There's a level of inspiration that has to happen. And I think Cap is capable of that, not only as an individual, but I think he's seen that way and he carries that weight um, and he carries it well. And so I think it makes the most sense that you know, Batman, to your point, he's going to do whatever he wants. That doesn't feel like a leader as much as somebody who tells people what to do. Maybe that there's, maybe there's, you know, validity to that. Um, and then Cyclops, he's a, he's a good He's a good tactician. He's he he executes, but he doesn't hold this. At least not for me. This weight outside of the X Men. He he's he's a leader, uh, insofar as his team executes something, but he's not a leader, uh, where it comes to like Professor X. Professor X is the 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 head mutant you think of in terms of, uh, um, uh, for lack of a better term, client facing. I am going to also buy on Cyclops. Yes, I'm going to sell on Cap and Batman because Cyclops, yes, he leads the X-Men, uh, but he's also a leader of men and women, just in general. His responsibilities are greater than Cap's and Batman's in the sense that, you know, he has a people who need him. You know, not all mutants are powered and they need him. And in the field, you know, every decision that he makes, he's considering not just the team that's with him in the moment, but the team at home and the mutants that are relying on them to get the mission done. Every mission is more personal to Cyclops because every single time he steps out, he's fighting for his people. I think that he's an incredibly talented tactician. We see that every time they're in a fight, Cyclops is front and center giving commands. Batman's often fucking off. You know, um, <laughs> doing his thing. Yeah, and Cap is and Cap is inspiring simply by him being there. I think he his leadership is strategic, but it's also Superman like, where because he's there, you feel like you can do more. Cyclops has to give orders and direction and come up with team synchronicities and shit like that. I don't really remember any fastball specials in uh, in the Justice League. So my answer is I'm buying on Cyclops. Mm -mm. That's true. There is no combo moves in Justice League that I can think of. Avengers do it all the time. Yeah, not off the top of my head. What do what is there Avengers one? I couldn't even think of that fastball special. Oh, there's the Ant Man on the arrow. Oh sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Cap oh will, yeah. Cap sure. will use a shield to like launch people or yeah. you know like deflect beams or something. There's a lot more synchronicity in the Avengers and X Men. And, and I feel like a lot of a lot of times that's in the moment shit whereas we've seen scenes where they're making like they're 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 they have new moves that they put together mm. you know um in the x-men so yeah for me it's cyclops all day every day uh chat what's what what do you guys say i see uh i see buy on batman it's a lot of batman it's a logical answer batman makes sense yeah it, it it makes sense to similarly get to get the job done, but Batman feels like a character who just will plow through you. Right? He, he he doesn't care. Uh, you can you can disagree, you can agree. At the end of the day, he's gonna get he's gonna get his shit done. If I'm the one on this team, I don't want Batman as my leader. I'm sorry. Word. And I also not not sure I want Cap as my leader too because I feel like he's too much of a Boy Scout sometimes. Well, Bat Batman didn't do shit during Beast World, so he's disqualified <laughs> off that alone. He did Superman though. He's not in, he's not even a, an option in this list. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. Superman's more egregious because Batman was at least turned during Beast World, so he had a, he yeah. had an out there. He had an excuse. Well, I mean, he's just floating outside with a little air mask. He's like, "What could we do? I being Superman and powerless." 
Philosopher King says buy on cap. Catherine says she was cap, but now she's Cyclops because of what Tyler said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's clearly Cyclops. Come on. There was a lot of news that dropped this week. We're not talking about any of it, but um, needless to say, we're going to have a shitload of things to talk about next week. Yeah, 100%. There's definitely some stuff that from, from an art standpoint, you know. What what are you talking about? Oh, I'm talking about Cadence, bro. Do, oh. Yeah, do we have a full on? We don't have a we have scuttlebutt on that. But I don't think we have a full on report about that yet. Nothing, nothing yet, seemingly. But yeah. I um, can talk to you about stuff off mic. But yeah. Ooh, um. Yeah, I mean, we got Super Bowl trailers coming out tomorrow. Allegedly, what? Deadpool three. So we'll see. The Super what? Uh, super Bowl. The big game. Sorry. Big, big, oh, big game, big game, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, Gavin says no comment on that. <laughs> Atomic yeah. Count says Sean dissing the bat because editorial wanted a Titan centered event. Listen, mm -hmm. it is what it is. I'm sorry. Batman was nowhere. Uh, Langston Brown says currently reading Fractions ult uh, Ultimate X Men, so Cyclops. Hey, nice. There it yeah, is. I got to go back and read that stuff. That was good shit, man. Oh. Um,. Yeah, so we actually have a we have a, a an announcement to make about our next guest that we'll be having on the show. None other. I'm sure a lot of people here will know who this person is. A lot of people probably enjoy their their work, their channel. Uh, we're going to be interviewing Sal from Comic Pop in two weeks. He's going to join us to talk about the state of YouTube. As far as comics go. Yeah. I have a lot to say about that. I'm sure he does too. You know, all of us here do what he does. So we've got, you know, we've got thoughts. And uh, we're going to be talking about those thoughts with him here on February 24th, two weeks out from yeah. today. It's not going to be a full episode. It's just going to be a YouTube short. So sorry. But that's just what gets better views. <laughs> the entirety of it. Yeah. The entirety is just one short. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Can't wait to talk to him about that. Uh, hopefully you guys show up for that, and we'll have to figure out what we're going to do for a giveaway for that because Sal doesn't have comics yet. Um, hmm. <laughs> Maybe we just get a volume one or something. We'll pick We'll pick between DC, Marvel, uh, DC, Marvel, and Image. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Real quick, uh, we are on the road to 2,000 subscribers. If you've enjoyed what we've done today, help us out. If you're unsubscribed, make sure to click that subscribe button. We want to say thank you to our patrons once again. If you want to join us, you can do that on patreon.com slash thecomicspals. Also want to say thank you to our channel members who uh, really are, are are doing great and supporting us. Um, love you guys. I mean, you know, doing YouTube is tough. You know, uh, if you're relying on ad revenue alone, that doesn't get it done. Most people have ad blockers. So the direct support is critical for what we do. And I really want to say thank you to everybody that does that. The next time that we will be live with you is Thursday at 10.15 a.m. Eastern for Pals Pulse. Joel Justice, one of our listeners, uh, is crusading yes. to get the Displaced number one to win the poll and usurp Action Comics 1061. And so I changed my vote. I know a lot of people changed their votes. Joel is... Joel is is preaching, you know, and Joel is is going around spreading the the good word about Ed Brisson, and uh, people are changing their tune. So if you want to do that, you can vote. Everybody can vote. YouTube.com slash the Comics Pals under the community tab. Um, vote your heart. Joel swayed my heart. So, old Joel. So Sean, for that that giveaway, Gavin uh, volunteered to do a sketch card for the giveaway. So. Oh shit, yeah. Gavin, that's incredible. Something like like this. I still gotta get a frame for it. I just Hey, look at that. Hey. Dude, that is that is absolutely awesome of you to to, to offer. Thank you uh, so much. Catherine, th uh, Thursday at six PM. I don't know if there was a a mix up there, but Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Thursday at six PM. My bad. Yeah. Uh question for Sean. Who has more flight time? Hal Jordan or Taylor Swift? Whoa, 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 whoa. We all like Taylor Swift here. We will not gain the ire of Swifties. 
I have no uh, I have no opinion about Taylor Swift actually, and so I will say that the answer I mean the answer is probably Taylor. I mean, listen, when you're that busy running around doing all these concerts and you know meeting your boyfriend or you know whatever she's flying around for, I saw a flight that was like an hour long or something like that. Um, you know, it's busy. She's a busy person, and you got to have a private you got to have a private jet. You just have to easily easily. Yeah. Oh, uh, Tom McCown. Thank you so much. Uh, super chat. Uh, just to thank you at the end for a fantastic interview and all you do for us. Really appreciate that, man. That was, thank you so much. Uh, and, and we're we're happy to bring it um, to you guys. I think this community really appreciates the 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 quality storytelling that we tend to read um, in comics, and uh, we get to dig into you know, the the nitty gritty with artists. So creators, really appreciate that. Yeah, that's huge, AH. Thank you so much. You you know you know what you mean to us. Really appreciate you, buddy. All right, we're going to get out of here. We'll see you guys on Thursday, 6 p.m. for Palace Pools. Be there. Thank you so much for joining us.